Welcome to this new video. Today, we will continue our introduction to Bitcoin. From the previous episode, you know that eventually, there will be exactly 21 million Bitcoins. You've understood the difference between a private key and a public key. That it is safe and even necessary to share your public key to receive Bitcoin from someone. And that you do not want to share your private key with anyone, as it provides total control over your Bitcoins. You understand from the previous episode that Bitcoin is a tool. A tool that looks nothing like anything you've come across so far. One thing I understood after hours of reading and research. The only way to truly apprehend how revolutionary cryptocurrencies are is by being ready to question and to reconsider the thinking patterns that we've known and that have shaped a lifetime of experiences. This emerging ecosystem can only be observed through a prism of view that is radically different from our usual patterns. A new kind of eyeglasses, if you wish. That's easy to say but not so easy to apply. Especially when your usual mental schemes have proven to be reliable. I humbly think that's the main reason why some eminent businessmen, intellectuals or economists that I really look up to are lacking to see what's in the Bitcoin. It's no coincidence that 95% of the Bitcoins are owned by someone who's from 18 to 40. And that 20% of the Bitcoin buyers are 18 to 24. Looking closer, the disproportion is even more significant, given that the 18 to 24 population is the group with the weakest purchasing power. When you are in your 20s, full of ideals, you'll be rather prone to hearing or supporting new or non-conventional concepts that could allow you changing the world. When for 50 years, you've been told or learned to see things in a certain way, dropping those cognitive models in order to see or things differently becomes extremely challenging. It's even harder when your usual mental schemes have always been key to success. Enough with the metaphors. Let's get real. We've mentioned in the previous video that you could compare Bitcoin network to a 21 million square meter digital land. Imagine now that each square meter parcel of this digital land is a vault. Imagine that those vaults follow operating procedures that are already defined and determined based on very strict rules. You are in some kind of bank. Except that there is no board of directors to manage this bank. No cashier, customer advisor or supervisor. No one with power to grant or deny access to banking services. No one to deny your fundamental right to have a bank account at your disposal. However, to be clear, such absence of authority or management does not mean there's any room for anarchy. To the contrary, this bank follows extremely strict and rigid rules. It's just that this bank is self-managed. That those rules have already been set once for all. The only thing remaining then is to verify that whatever action from whichever user is in compliance with those rules. Such verification and the resulting decision, for instance to grant transfer of bitcoins from one user to another, is achieved by way of extremely heavy cryptography calculations performed and verified at the same time, then recorded permanently at multiple locations. All of this done continuously in a transparent manner and by a huge number of computers that have no relationship whatsoever with each other. That's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so safe. For sure, this must be abstract. We'll illustrate it later. In another video, we'll come back on the cryptography calculations, the immutable or unalterable recording and decentralized nature of the network. Meanwhile, just consider that the Bitcoin network operates on basis of decentralized calculations, verifications and records. Title of this video is Bitcoin and Trust. Why is that? From end of the barter, all the financial models that have been implemented, are all based on trust. Unless you're buying and hiding gold coins or bullions in your garden, which is not the most secure or practical option, as soon as you have or use money, you're necessarily placing your trust in someone. If you're stashing US dollars notes under your mattress, you are trusting the US government. If you're saving US dollars at the bank, it means you are trusting both the US government and the bank. 
you're trusting and relying upon Eastern Union when you're sending money to your relatives. You're trusting Visa or another finance service intermediate during a transaction whether you're a buyer or a merchant. It's not necessarily bad, or good either. But it's an important fact which you need to be aware of and conscious about. Well, with Bitcoin there is no such need to trust a third party. No one to decide whether or not you can access, use or send your Bitcoins based on your income, passport, political opinion, size, or high. So long that you're using a private wallet, you're not lending or giving control over your Bitcoins to anyone. The only thing that you have to trust is the Bitcoin network. And that is basically mathematics. Why is this crucial? And why is this key to apprehending how revolutionary Bitcoin is? When you make a deposit on your bank account, you probably imagine your money being saved somewhere, somehow. But the reality is different. Your deposit is a liability owed by the bank to you. A debt, if you prefer. In effect, the depositor's savings are immediately and very largely used by the bank for its own investments. Mostly in the form of loans to third parties, in government's bonds, or in stocks. This tiny detail means that when you make a cash deposit, you surrender the legal title to your cash, as it becomes an asset of the bank. In turn, the account is a liability to the bank. In other words, the day that your bank collapses or that there is a major default in the financial system, it may be that you can simply not recover your deposits. Remember, they are liabilities of the bank. In other words, when you hear the expression bank deposits, the term actually refers to the liability owed to you by the bank, and not to the actual funds that you've deposited. That's a subtle detail. But the devil is in the details. It means that in case of bankruptcy, when you will be willing to withdraw your funds, you will queue with all other creditors of the bank. Amongst the creditors, priority will be given first to the government for taxes collection, usually come then the employees for their wages, etc. Then come all the other debtors, including the depositors. Now you should be wondering, has it ever happened? Yes. Did it happen recently? Yes. Did it happen often? Well, often enough for it to be given a name, bail-in. It happened notably in Cyprus, a state member of the European Union in year 2013. All uninsured depositors with deposits larger than €100,000 in the Bank of Cyprus lost a substantial portion of their deposits. In return, the depositors received bank stocks. However, the value of these stocks did not equate to most depositors' losses. If 2013 seems far, you could look at what happened in Greece in 2015. Athens decided to shutter banks in a defensive move to prevent a bank run as the government's negotiations with its creditors collapsed. If 2015 still seems far, you could look at what happened more recently in Lebanon. Following the first large demonstration of October 2019, Lebanese commercial banks closed for two weeks. When they reopened, they unlawfully restricted depositors' access to their own money in U.S. dollars, despite no official capital control being in place. As this channel is not meant to provide financial advice, I am not urging you to run at your bank at once to withdraw all your money. My aim remains only to share facts and analyses. Having said that, I would add that for few years now, we've been in a situation where inflation reaches numbers that are extremely preoccupying. For sure, the anti-COVID measures implemented by the governments worldwide, together with the Ukrainian crisis have had an effect on the increase of the prices. However, simplifying current situation to those two parameters would be extremely reductive. Current global crisis is not just due to a mean hungry pangolin in China and to the actions of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. In most of the Western countries, notably in the US and in Europe, printing an indecent quantity of money without any counterpart increase of the production has become the favorite game of the central banks. Most countries have been trying to leave beyond their means. Now, 
you should be starting to understand the significance of the absence of intermediates or third parties with Bitcoin. You should start detecting the differences between the deposits you leave at the bank and your Bitcoins. Thank you for watching this video. Share it and subscribe to help me developing it. Leave your questions or subjects you wish me to tackle in the comments. See you soon, with new videos.